Fundamental mysteries and the Christian worldview. What prompts a religious quest? Now, we have a Wednesday meal, students cooking for students at the Chapter Centre every week. And I say to the, I often say to the students, there's about a 120 of them turn up, or sometimes 150 have to shout. I say, I've got three questions for you to discuss over this meal while you're eating. Mm. Number one, why is there a universe? Mm, right? Mm. Now, that has two possible meanings. Why is there something and not nothing? Why is there a universe at all? Why isn't there just nothing? Mm. Mm. Or it could mean... What is the purpose of the universe? But I use it in the first sense. Why is there a universe at all? And the second question I ask them is this. Who at your table is going to do the washing up? <laughs> and then the third question is, which of these two questions is the most important or interesting? Right? <laughs> OK. Now, John Polkinghorne, do we all know that name, John Polkinghorne? OK, he's a fellow of the Royal Society, which means not just a professor of mathematical physics, in his case at Cambridge, but particularly elevated because of his brilliance. He's also an Anglican clergyman. He says there are, and he's, he writes a lot on the science theology issues. Two types of people. Those who wonder why there is something and not nothing. Do you ever wonder that? Mm. And those who don't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. If God exists, why does he exist? You see, we can, I can say, why is there a universe? And so the Muslims came to me afterwards and said, well, there is only one answer to that. Well, of course, I would say, well, there at least we agree. But um, if God exists, why does he exist? It just throws the question one stage back. Whether or not God exists, we are face to face with the mystery, why does anything exist at all? Stephen Hawking puts it this way. Do we all know the name Stephen Hawking? A Brief History of Time. Why does the universe go to all the bother of existing? He puts it in, in A Brief History of Time. And Jack Smart, atheist philosopher, he writes a long essay on why the arguments for the existence of God uh, can be refuted. He thinks he's refuted them. I don't think he has, but he claims he has refuted them. But right at the end of the article, he says this. Why should anything exist at all? It is, for me, a matter of the deepest awe. Right? That question right at the end of the road has got no answer to it, apart from God. But then you've got the question, why does God exist? Well, if you read uh, Keith, um, Keith Ward's book, God, Chance and Necessity, he gives an argument there for why God must exist, really, whether or not there is a universe. But that's another issue. Why does nature have a reliable and rational structure? That's another question. Why are there laws of nature, right? Now the moon goes around the earth. Why does it do that? Well, we know the answer to that. God pushes it, right? Or is that the right, is that the right answer? Well, uh, no, because gravity was discovered and if you realise how gravity works, then you'll realise that will keep the moon in orbit around the Earth. So it's not God after all. There's gravity. What's the false assumption in that reasoning I have just given you? It's not God, but it's gravity. There's a, sorry? Gravity. Who created gravity? You see, this, the assumption behind that reasoning is the old post-Newtonian reasoning, not Newton himself, but after Newton, that the laws of nature, it's better not to call them laws of nature actually, but laws, let's call them laws of nature for the moment, the laws of nature like gravity, electromagnetism, and that, are eternal. They don't need any explanation for their existence, they just exist. So there we are, we've got lots of laws of nature, and then the universe appears, either God created it or something else. The, 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 I don't know what Stephen Hawking says, the wave function of the universe. But let's, the universe appears, and so the law of gravity, which has had nothing to do for all eternity, <laughs> suddenly has got something to act on. It can act on, on, on the stars and the galaxies and the earth and the moon and keep on in orbit. So the law of gravity has got no, nothing to do for all eternity until the universe appears. Now that was the assumption. 
right? But it's a false assumption. Because the laws of nature depend upon the existence of nature. The creation of nature includes the creation of the laws of nature. So saying that the, the moon goes around the earth uh, is not God, it's gravity, is false reasoning. Because where does gravity come from? Mm. Mm. Electrons say, relate to other things in this way and not that way. Why is there such a law? Right? It would be far easier to imagine a universe where things did not react with one another. Well, we wouldn't be here, and there wouldn't be any stars or anything, but it's far, far more easy to imagine a universe where it was just made of a lot of particles or packets of energy which did not relate to one another. But because in the atom, electrons relate to other things in certain this way and not that way, then the universe is able to hold together. There are laws of nature that, we, that are examinable by science. What, but why are there laws? Yes, now I go most years to the Edinburgh Science Festival and last year I went to a lecture on string theory. You probably don't know what that is, but, um, or maybe you do. But the lecturer started off by talking about the standard model of the atom, the way that at the heart of the atom, the protons and electrons all relate to one, pro, well, no, sorry, protons and neutrons at the heart of the atom and it relates to the electrons and, and how the forces that hold the nucleus of the atom together, the strong force, the weak force, electromagnetic force, all those forces. It, he explained to us what we learn, perhaps in school physics or first year university, year of, year of university physics, how it all works, holds together, and what a beautiful picture of reality it is. And then he said this, he said, although we know how it all works together and what a beautiful picture it is, this standard model of the atom, we don't know why it is like this. We just know that it is like this, but we don't know why it is. And then he said, my purpose of my lecture now is to explain to you why it is we have discovered that there may be what we call strings, millions of times smaller than a proton. Well, I won't bore you with what strings are now, but they might, that, it, that all these things ultimately have their origin in vibrating strings, vibrating in 11 dimensions, actually, which give rise to these fundamental particles or of, 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 of matter. So that's the answer. <laughs> what question should have been asked to him at the end of the lecture? Yes? Why strings? But he didn't ask that. And does that why question go on forever? Okay? Mm -hmm. We'll come back to that. So I say, or does it? String theory answers the why question, or does it? Mm. Oh, sorry. Now, some words of Bertrand Russell in his introduction to the history of Western philosophy. And I've added the emphasis. All definite knowledge belongs to science. All dogma as to what surpasses definite knowledge belongs to theology. But between theology and science there is a no man's land. This no man's land is philosophy. Almost all the questions of most interest to speculative minds are of such that science cannot answer. And the confident answers of theologians no longer seem convincing. The questions are, is the world divided into mind and matter? And if so, what is mind and what is matter? Is mind subject to matter or is it possessed of independent powers? Has the universe any unity or purpose? Is it evolving towards some goal? Are there really laws of nature or do we believe in them only because of our innate love of order? Is man what he seems to the astronomer, a tiny lump of impure carbon? and water impotently crawling on a small unimportant planet? Or is he what he appears to Hamlet? Is he perhaps both at once? Is there a way of living that is noble and another that is base? Or are all ways of living merely futile? If there is a way of living that is noble, in what does it consist? And how shall we achieve it? Must the good be eternal in order to deserve to be valued? Or is it worth seeking even if the universe is inexorably moving towards death? To such questions, no answer can be found in the laboratory. The studying of these questions, if not the answering of them, is the business of philosophy. That's from his introduction to West, Western philosophy, which I read twice in my later years. Mm. Now, I, I've underlined that sentence near the top. 
And I always want you to think about that brief sentence, all definite knowledge belongs to science. What's wrong with that statement? Why must it? Why is it illegitimate to make that statement science. from any point of view? Pardon? Science changes opinion. Well, science changes opinion, yes. But he would, Bertrand Russell would say it would still come up with conclusions which are valid. Reality is greater than anticipation. How do you know that? I mean, I agree with you, of course. Well, I'll tell you why. Um, all definite knowledge belongs to science. That means the only things we can know are things that will be proved by science. But that sentence itself can't be proved by science. Right? That sentence itself cannot be proved from science. Therefore, if it is true, it is not true. It is what we call a self-refuting statement. Okay? Are you with me, ladies and gentlemen? Self-refuting statements are very useful in doing philosophy, right? Bertrand Russell, a very clever man, but he hadn't realized... I just realized it... I've used this quotation from him a few times. I used it in China this summer. But I've only just realized very recently that that very first statement is self-refuting. Um, okay. So those are the questions which he says cannot be answered by science. What is goodness? What is the noble life? What is mind? What is matter? I'm going to be looking at these questions in a minute. I'll be explaining why they can't be answered by science. He says they can only be... The only way of answering them is from theology, the word of God, but he doesn't believe in God. He says philosophy can discuss them, but it can't answer them. All right? So... According to Bertrand Russell, not only are these questions that are unanswerable by science the most interesting, they are the most important. Because he actually says later in the History of Western Philosophy, page 789, that not only are they interesting, but they are very important. Without belief in theology, i.e. God who speaks a word, Russell says they have no answer. As an atheist agnostic, he has to hold a paradoxical view that the most interesting and important questions for humans have no answers. Unless you believe in theology. All that philosophy can do is discuss them. Now, my, our oldest son, Douglas, he, he did economics at the university, but he did philosophy as one of his modules. I remember him saying that all the, all the questions that they were posed with in philosophy and asked to discuss, none of them could be answered. They could only be discussed uh, because of lack of belief in God, really. Every, if you lose God, everything collapses, really. The way we know things, what is good, what is bad, what is mind, what is matter, etc. I, but I also believe the cross of Christ is necessary to make sense of things. And I'm reminded of these words, which I think were read to us this morning in a different translation. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. Well, there's a very wise man, or so it was believed, Bertrand Russell. And he, he says the most basic questions have no answer. But they do have an answer from theology, as Paul says. Now, let's, I want to look at his questions now, that he says are unanswerable. Bertrand Russell's a great hero in China, which is officially an atheist country, and that's why I use this text, not exactly this talk, use this talk this summer when I went to China to talk to people in the university there. But what is mind? Well, let's think about that. If science could one day fully examine my brain, 
could the scientist discover my actual thoughts? Right? The thought that tomorrow I have a service to take in the morning and uh, or the thought that I am going to creep hydro for a little holiday in January, Those, that's what's going on in my mind. Could a scientist, by examining my brain, know that I'm thinking about those things? Right? The question is not, could he discern from the firing of the neurons what I'm thinking about? I don't think he could, actually. But supposing in the future he could discern from the way the neurons in the brain were firing what I was thinking about, that is not the question. The question is, you see, I don't have to... I'm not, thinking of, I'm not aware of the firing of the neurons in my brain, but I know what I'm thinking about. Right? I know I'm thinking of my holiday next year. But I'm not aware of the firing of neurons in the brain. I, but I'm immediately aware of what I'm thinking about, obviously. Now, could a scientist, by looking in my brain, see straight away that I'm thinking about my holiday next year? If the answer is no, then he can't see my thoughts. And he doesn't know what's on my mind. In other words, he can know everything about my brain and nothing about my mind. Now, mind and brain are obviously related, because if my brain is smashed, then I can't, don't have any thoughts. So there's a relationship, but they're not the same thing. It's a necessary relationship. My mother, who has dementia, in the earlier stages of dementia, when she couldn't remember anything, she, uh, but she knew that she couldn't remember anything, she used to say, oh, my brain is not what it should be. And that is right. It, it, was, it is her brain that is deteriorating. And that is affecting her mind, so she can't think properly. But the two are not the same thing. Mm. Now Leibniz, is mill, is saying something similar. Leibniz, uh, Bertrand Russell thought that Leibniz was one of the most, well he thought together with Pythagoras, the most clever men that had ever existed on, in, on planet Earth. And Bertrand Russell was an expert on Leibniz. Now, Leibniz invented many things, discovered many things, roughly at the same time as Isaac Newton, though he was independent of Newton. And they both independently discovered calculus. Now, Leibniz said this. He said, if your brain was as big as a mountain and I could walk inside it, I would see all sorts of things moving in your brain as it was working. But one thing I wouldn't see was a thought. I would never meet a thought or an idea, which is just really what I've said. So therefore, Leibniz concluded that your bright brain and mind are different. So another question I sometimes ask the students on a Wednesday evening, I say, is your brain the same as your mind? And if not, where is your mind? And that's another question. Then I, the next question is, who's going to do the washing up? Etc. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> the question is not, could the scientist infer from the neurons what I'm thinking about, but could he actually read or see my thoughts? If not, my mind must be more than my physical brain. My mind affects my behaviour. I'm thinking about my holiday next year, so I'm going to affect my behaviour, I'm going to go to the travel agent and book it. Right? So my thoughts, my mind, affects what I do with my physical body. Therefore, it follows that it is real. My mind is real. Because it has a real effect on the physical world. But it is itself not entirely physical. So therefore, we have the non-physical acting on the physical. Sometimes people wonder how God can act on the physical world and answer your prayers. Well, it's a mystery. But he does because we know that our thoughts act on our physical body and enable us to do things. Like raise our hand. That's a mystery too, how I did that. It is a mystery. We take it for granted, but it's a mystery. Even if you understood all the processes of the muscles and the nerves that are going on between my brain and the hand, what is it that makes that initial decision to lift the arm? That must be a non-physical thing. It's a great mystery. Mm. Mm. So we have something that is real, 
but it's not subject to scientific investigation. However much a science examines my brain, he's not going to know my mind. Let's go on with mind. Another thing, it, uh, a mystery about the mind, is consciousness. Now here we have something which is processing a mass of information, the computer. But it doesn't know that it is processing a lot of information. It's not happy that I've given it its job and it's got a part to play in this lecture. And it's not disappointed uh, if I left it home and brought another one. Not that I've got another one. It, w it, it is not conscious, right? It is not consciously aware of anything. Just as a book you're reading doesn't know anything, the, the author of the book knew, knows things, and you, the reader, on reading it, learn things, but the book itself doesn't know anything. It just stores information, and this does, stores it more, um, uh, in a more complex way, the computer. But, you're, but you store information, and I do, in our brains, but we're aware of that information. We can think about it, and uh, we are consciously, and so we can, be, we can be happy or sad, angry or disappointed or pleased in a way that a computer can't. So what is consciousness? How do you explain that in terms of physical processes? Computers and robots have no interior awareness. If I was a computer expert, which I'm not, I could come to a full understanding of this computer by taking it to bits and know everything about it. But I couldn't come to a full understanding of you by taking you to bits on the operating table. Because you have an interior, you, there's something about you which is only known from the inside looking out, that can't be known from the outside looking in. Only you really know what it's like to be you. And only me knows what it's really like to be me. I, only me, only I know what, it, what that colour mauve of the, it is to my eyes. I can't prove that it's the same to your eyes. It probably is, but I can't prove it. That's what Protagoras meant, by the way, when he said man is the measure of all things. He meant each only each individual knows what he thinks he knows and sees. That's what he meant. Plato disagreed with him on that, but that's another point. Now, let's ask this question. What is it like to be a bat? You ever wondered that? Mm -hmm. There is a way that it is like to be a bat. Right? That is definitely something real. This is a subjective fact about the bat's state of consciousness. The bat is conscious, assume, right? The objective facts about the bat do not reveal the subjective facts. You can ex the scientist can examine the bat in great detail, but he doesn't know what it feels like to be a bat. He can detect how the bat sees, in inverted commas, through radar as it flies around in the dark. He still doesn't, he can't imagine what it's like to be a bat. Mm. Thus science, being limited to objective facts, cannot explain consciousness. That's the argument. He can have a full explanation of what the computer is, but not a full explanation of consciousness. Mm. A word from the Bible. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him. There we are. The Apostle Paul said this an awful long time ago. The same thing. Hmm. In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually discerned. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ? Actually, there is a way that I can know your mind. There is a way I can know your mind, and you can know my mind. Not by examining your brain, but another method of knowing. It's called friendship. Right? When you are friends with somebody, and you live in their presence, and you hear what they say, you talk to them, you 
don't know everything about their mind, but you do grow to know more and more about their mind. So a wife might say to her husband, I can read you like a book. She may not get it right all the time, but that's what she means by that, because she knows you personally, right? So you, you, we can reveal what's on our mind by talking and what we do, and when we live in a relationship of trust with somebody, we do know one another's minds. So friendship is a real way of knowing. So all the, but it isn't an exact way of knowing. It is not measurable or verifiable, but it is nevertheless real way of knowing. And that's how we know persons. It, if to get to know you, it would be inappropriate to dissect you but it would be appropriate to be your friend. That would be a way to know you. And similarly, to know God, you have to have a personal friendship with him. We call it, theologically and biblically, faith. Right? That's what it is. And that's why we are saved by faith, and we live by faith, not by works of the law. Because that's how, that's how you relate to persons. And God is a person. And in that relationship with God, we actually, if I dare say so, through the, we, as Paul says, we have the mind of Christ, we know something, if I dare say this, a little bit of what it is like to be God. In, in his love for a lost and suffering world. And fundamental to the Christian faith is that not only does God know us from the outside looking in, but also through Christ who became one with us, he knows us from the inside looking out. That's the meaning of the incarnation. Christ looks through our eyes and thinks with our brain and feels with our heart. So he knows what it's like to be human from the inside. Right? That's the meaning of the incarnation. He knows our suffering and death from the inside. looking out. He is thus the redeemer of the whole person, body and soul. Body, what we see when we look at someone from the outside, the soul is that inward aspect of someone who's looking out through their eyes. What is it that's looking through your eyes right now and hearing with your ears and thinking with your brain? What is the self? The Buddhists, Buddhists say there is no self. Oh, it's an odd belief for Buddhism, but it is a Buddhist belief. Um, and it's, all, it's an atheist belief too, strictly speaking, there is no self. David Hume, for example, believed that not only does the self not continue after death, but it doesn't continue in life either. So when the police came to me last night and said, you robbed the bank 11 years ago, I said, you got the wrong guy. <laughs> because... Uh, he doesn't exist anymore. All the cells of his body have changed, right? Um, so th there is no self, right? Well, that actually isn't true, but uh, that didn't happen that the police came to my house last night. But anyway, but that, logically speaking, I could answer that, you see, because physically I am not the same. If you hold to that view, which is the Buddhist and atheist belief, I couldn't say I went to primary school. Because the one who went to primary school was physically very different than this. But because there is a self, an inner uh, that doesn't change, but an inner self, that I can say, I went to primary school, or I robbed a bank. Mm -hmm. There's an ancient Buddhist text called the the questions of King Melinda. And at the beginning of it, the Buddhist monk Nagasena goes to see King Melinda. And King Melinda begins to ask him questions. And the first question is, are you Nagasena? And Nagasena says, there is no such person. That's the beginning of it. That, uh, it but he is a Nagasena, but he just denies that there is a self, that there is a person. 
That later leads on to the question, how can there be reincarnation, as the Buddhists believe in, if there is no self to be reincarnated? Well, they have their answer to that, but uh, there is an answer they give to that. Rather unconvincing, I must say, but there is an answer. Hmm. Okay. Some believe that the mind is only a physical brain, but if that were true, would it solve the mystery? Okay, it, I'm putting these questions that Bertrand Russell gives in green. Is the world divided into mind and matter, or are mind and physical brain identical? That's one thing he's asking. Well, let's ask this other question then. What is physical matter? We've seen that the question, what is mind, leads to a mystery. Now let's think of something which, we, which ought not to be mysterious. What is matter? What is this stuff here, this physical stuff all around us? Well, what actually is it? Well, Bertrand Russell says it's a mystery. Why? Hmm. Well, if you say, let's take something, uh, some physical stuff called water. Well, we, I'm sure we all know it's made of two atoms of oxygen, uh, of hydrogen, and one of oxygen is a molecule of water. Okay, so we think we know a bit of what water is. But then what is hydrogen? Well, it's one proton and one electron going around it. Okay, so we're getting nearer to the answer now. So what is a proton? Well, a proton seems to be made of quarks. So what are quarks? You see, with every stage, we get nearer there, but we never get there. Do you follow what I mean? We never get there. So we never answer the question, what is matter? What is physical matter? So reductionism is bound to reveal mystery. Reduction, reducing everything to its component parts, is bound to reveal mystery. But supposing we say, ah, now we've got it. This is the smallest thing. There is nothing smaller than this particle. This is it. You can't break this in, into its components anymore. You've still got a mystery, because then you've got something that is not composed of anything. Now that is very odd, because anything in the normal sense is composed of something. Now if your most fundamental particle, we shouldn't really call it a particle, but if we do call it a particle for a moment, is not composed of anything, then it is very strange. Mm. And as physics advances, we have quantum mechanics in the middle of the 20th century and string theory at the end of the 20th century, they expose the inherent mystery. And I could talk a lot about that, but I, you'll be glad to know I'm not going to right now, except to say the, these very these three basic things, uncertain principle, non-locality, EPR. Uncertain principle is, well, let's take an ordinary thing like a railway train traveling at 60 miles an hour through, uh, through Berwick on Tweed Railway Station, right? So you know where it is, it's on Berwick on Tweed Railway Station, and you know its position, you know its position, Berwick on Tweed Railway Station, you know its velocity, six miles, 60 miles an hour. That's perfectly possible. Right? But when you get down to these fundamental constituents of nature, if you know where something is, you can't know how fast it's going. If you know how fast it's going, you can't know where it is. So its, it's whole character is different than a thing in the ordinary sense. That's the uncertainty principle. Non-locality means that things uh, react, seem to relate to one another across the bounds of space and time even though there's no way they, they're coming in contact with one another. You get two electrons, they, they've got a spin. Actually, they don't spin like this, but the, let's just say they're spinning, and they've been related, and they're spinning and spinning, and they're going apart, and they're a million miles apart, and there's no signal going between the two of them. You change the spin on one in your laboratory here, the other one changes its spin immediately. Whatever happens to this affects that, even though there's no way they are communicating. And they're a million miles apart, even on the other side of the universe. Mm -hmm. 
Thus, even if mind is explained in terms of matter, the mystery remains. Let's just suppose we can understand mind and say, ah, we've solved the mystery now, it's an aspect of the physical brain and that's all it is. We still haven't solved the mystery because we don't know what physical matter which makes the brain is. We don't know what matter is. So, here we are. What is everything made of? If matter is made of particles, what are the particles made of? And that's what I've just been talking about. Now let's come to Leibniz again with his, another one of his ways he argued, and this is, what he, this is his argument. You break things down to their constituent parts, you imagine trying to do that, if, you, if the smallest thing, he said, what was of finite size, however small it was still of measurable, it's still of finite size, then he said that can't be the smallest thing because you could always break it in two. Right? So the smallest thing must be infinitely small, said Leibniz. But matter occupies space. It takes up space. So the smallest thing, which is infinitely small, said Leibniz, cannot be matter. Therefore matter is not made of matter. That was his reasoning. So what else could he think of? He said a soul. Matter is made of souls. And what is a soul? Something that is beyond the dimensions of our space-time. And that is what he's been, all these hundreds of years later, the later part of the 20th century, in this mysterious way of, of EPR, uncertainty principle and non-locality, we do reach what some physicists call a ghostly world. Right? I don't know whether they were aware of the fact that Leibniz had reasoned that it must be a ghostly world, soul, a world of souls. When you get right down there, you have a mysterious world. Okay, let's move on. Now, if matter is a wave or a force, a wave or force in what medium? See, the, the, amongst the ancient Greeks there were two theories about what everything was made of. Some thought it was made of tiny, tiny particles. Right? They were called the atomists. And when in school physics and chemistry we learn about atoms and molecules, we get the atomist view of reality. We think it's made of little particles, like miniature billiard balls. But some of the ancient Greeks say it's not made of particles. Matter is, all made, is, is a wave or a force. So where these forces interact with one another, then matter appears. And in fact, that's an interesting thing that they had that difference of opinion, because that is in fact the case. In modern physics, you have the, what's called the wave-particle duality. Sometimes light appears, seems to behave as if it's a stream of particles. But sometimes it behaves as if it's a wave or a force. The same with an electron. And it can't be both. We cannot imagine how it can be both. But it, I've already spoken about uh, the particles. If it's made of particles, it leads to the mystery of particles made of what? But if it's a wave or a force, we still have a mystery because waves or forces take place in a medium. Like there's a wave at the moment coming from my mouth to your ears going through the medium of air. If this room was a vacuum, you wouldn't be able to hear what I'm saying. Mm. Or we might have a wave in the medium of the sea. Or a wave in the medium of a piece of rope. You might do that with a piece of rope and you see the wave going along it. So if everything is coming from waves, waves in what medium? Waves don't just play, take place in a vacuum. So it's still a mystery. And yet light, which is a wave, travels to us through the vacuum of space from the stars. That's another mystery. Okay? Which Michelson and Morley in their experiment. Anyway, that goes on to relativity theory and we won't bore you with that. Okay, information on word. Mm. 
When we consider matter or energy as a wave or a field, we find that it's a wave understandable by mathematics. Galileo said, mathematics is the language with which God wrote the universe. Right? I've forgotten who else, who, who said, but someone, has, it, was, it was a scientist last century who said, God seems to be addicted to arithmetic. <laughs> right? Okay. <laughs> Now consider a message in a letter or a formula in a mathematical treatise. Right? I just, just want you to think about that for a moment. Is the message or the formula explained by the chemistry of the ink and the paper or the mind who wrote the letter or the treatise? Well, it's obvious. Okay? You read a letter. Could you have found out what the message in that letter is by examining the chemistry of the ink? on the paper? Well, obviously not. Because the information comes from the mind who wrote the letter in ink on the, on the paper, right? The chemistry of the ink tells you nothing about the message. Are you with me? And it seems that underlying everything, there is a message. Matter arises from information. In one of his non-religious books on quantum theory, John Polkinghorne says, it is intelligibility from which all physical existence emerges. So information, in the form of mathematics, lies in and behind all physical reality. See, what people have thought that information is getting bits, chunks of matter, and you put them in a particular order, and that's gives a sentence. So the chunks of matter are prior to the meaning of the sentence. But now it seems it's the other way round that the, the, uh, the, a sentence meaning language gives rise to matter. Recently the theoretical physicist Paul Davis wrote this. He says, normally we think of the world as composed of simple, clod-like material particles and information as a derived phenomenon attached to special organized states of matter. But maybe it is the other way around. Perhaps the universe is really information, a frolic of primal information, he says, and material objects, a complex second, are, that should be R, a complex secondary manifestation. That's New Scientist 1999. Not information coming from mindless matter, but matter coming from information coming from mind. Right? The source of all information has to be mind. If Paul Davis is right, then it re resonates with the Bible's teaching that word, that's how information is expressed, is the foundation of all things. Okay, uh, I just want to pause there a minute before we get into this diversion. I, I, let's think of mind and brain again. As I say, I won't know your mind by examining your brain, but I do know your mind through word. Word is the way, word is the, way the mind is expressed. Isn't it? Now, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Have you ever been puzzled by that? The Word was with God, and the Word was God. How can it be the same? How can those both make sense? Well, let's think of mind. Word is the expression of mind. There we are, there's you. You have a mind. But you are your mind too. The real you is your mind. Okay, so you are a mind and you have a mind are both sensible ways of expressing that, the fact that you have a mind. You are your word, is the way the mind's expressed, and you have a word. The word was with God and the word was God. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, how did life originate? This is a diversion, but it's... Relevant. The atheist, our good friend Richard Dawkins, writes this. 
What lies at the heart of every living thing is not a fire, warm breath, or a spark of life. It is information, words, instructions. Think of a billion discrete digital characters. If you want to understand life, think about information technology. We know, I'm, do we all know that the, at the heart of living things is a DNA molecule? Do we know that? Which is not just a complex molecule, it is, a la it is a la molecules arranged in certain way as to give a language, a code, a code, a recipe from which tells the cell how to grow into a mouse or an elephant or an oak tree or a human being. It comes from this instructions, right? It's information. Richard Dawkins tells us it's not what the ancients used to think, fire or warm breath or a spark of life, it's actually information or words. So, so that, that's right, we believe, agree with Richard Dawkins there, I think. So we seem to have information at the foundation of, of non-living matter and at a higher level we also have information, the DNA code, as a foundation of living matter as well. Are you with me, ladies and gentlemen? Good. Now, this is it, this is. Here's a simple cell of life, put it in a very simple way, and I am not a biologist, so don't ask me too quest many questions about it, but that's the simplest form of life that we understand it. It's got a nucleus made up of DNA, which is, uh, which are the instructions telling the the yellow bit on the outside is the cytoplasm, that's a, that's a chemical factory for making proteins. Now how does the chemical factory know how to make proteins? Hmm. Well, it's given instructions by the DNA. But it reads a different alphabet than the DNA, so there has to be a translator translating between the two, and that's called the RNA. The RNA translates the DNA so that the cytoplasm can understand it, and make proteins. There's a simple cell of life. What hasn't it got yet? It hasn't got a brain, it hasn't got nervous system, it hasn't got eyes, ears, liver, bloodstream, hair, petals, bark. It's got nothing like this. It's just a simple cell of life. The chemical factory receives its instructions from the very complicated DNA code. The DNA is a code written in a four-letter alphabet. Each letter is a different nucleotide. The DNA code, even for a simple bacteria, may be thousands of letters long, or millions. These letters have to be in a particular order to provide the information necessary for the manufacture of the proteins. The DNA sends its instructions to the cytoplasm via the RNA, which translates the instructions so that the cytoplasm can understand. The DNA, cytoplasm and the RNA are each made by the very cells of which they are a part. Now that is a, that is a great mystery. In his award-winning book, Consilience, Edward Wilson, the eminent non-religious, in fact anti-religious science writer, who's recently won him many prestigious Prizes tells us that the cells use very modern technology involving digital logic, analog digital conversion and signal integration. He tells us that this complexity exceeds that of supercomputers and space vehicles. The Encyclopedia Britannica. The origin of the code, DNA code. A critical and unsolved problem in the origin of life is the origin of the genetic code. The molecular apparatus supporting the operation of the code, the activating enzymes, adapter RNAs, messenger RNAs, and so on, are themselves each produced according to instructions contained within the code. At the time of the origin of the code, such an elaborate molecular apparatus was, of course, absent. Right? Hmm. Douglas Hofstadter, a world-famous and non-religious artificial intelligence expert, writes, a natural and fundamental question to ask on learning of these incredibly, intricately interlocking pieces of software and hardware is how did they ever get started in the first place? From simple molecules to entire cells is almost beyond one's power to imagine. 
there are various theories on the origin of life. They all run aground on this most central of central questions, how did the genetic code, along with its mechanisms for translation, originate? Now, even if you believe in biological evolution, remember that biological evolution can only start, if you believe in it, after this is in place. It cannot be the source of this. Some say that life's beginnings may have been much simpler than this. It, to me, that's really just a, a way of saying, well, we can't understand it, so it must have been simpler. How, however, we still have the problem of the origin, not just of complexity, but of information. You could never discern the message in a manuscript from the chemistry of the paper and ink. Now, uh, astronomers, some of them, are looking for signs of intelligent life in other parts of the universe. They're looking for signals. Now, how are they going to discern the difference between a regular beep, going beep, 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 and a source of intelligent information? Well, there is a way to discern. If, the, if it's not just a regular beep, which could have been caused by the physics or chemistry of the star, like a neutron star, will give a regular beep, but that doesn't mean there's intelligent life. But that if they discover language giving useful information, such as 11 is a prime number, if that message is coming from a star, then they know it's intelligent life, if there's in that kind of information. Archaeologists looking for l discovering an ancient rock, they see markings on this rock. They might say, are these patterns made by the weather? Or are they, is it writing by intelligent beings? Well, as soon as they discover that it's writing, giving information, that King so-and-so died at such and such, up because of such and such an event, then they know it's not the weather that did that. Somebody had to write it. Information means mind. And there is information at the heart of nature, of life, and even non-living things. We return now to Bertrand Russell's question. Does nature have a purpose? If there is a purpose, can this purpose be understood from within nature, or does it imply a transcendent reality for which it exists? Those are, that's his question. Dawkins, Leakey, and Atkins. I put those three names, all famous atheist scientists. A lot of scientists are not atheists, but they are, those three. What do they say? Very explicitly, I referred to it a bit this morning, they say there is no purpose to the universe, to human life. All three of them say that quite clearly. Do good and evil exist as objective realities or are they subjective judgments? I was talking about this this morning. Is there a real goodness that is independent of us or is it just our opinion that such and such a thing is good and such and such a thing is bad? The product of the way we as individuals or societies have developed. For example, is cruelty to children evil in itself, intrinsically evil, or is it just that we don't like it? Are courage and kindness good in themselves, intrinsically good, or is it just that we, or is it just that we like them? Right. So if Hitler had won the war, killed everyone who disagreed with him, brainwashed everybody else, so that all human beings who were left on the earth agreed that Hitler did right in the in the in Auschwitz, everybody agrees with that. In my hypothetical example, does that make it right? No, surely we would say that even if everybody agrees that it's right, it is still wrong. That's because right and wrong are not determined by the opinions of human beings, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. If they were determined by human beings, then we could say, well, if the majority of people vote for genocide, then genocide's right. Virtual, oh, I gave this this morning, yes. I cannot see how to refute arguments for subjectivity of moral values. As an atheist, he can't. He has to hold to the subjectivity of moral values. 
but I find it myself incapable of believing that all that's wrong with cruelty to children is that I don't like it. Mm. Now let's look at this. Drusilla Scott's book, Every Man Revived, about Michael Polanyi's bid, he, bid, she bid, he bids us compare two quotations. Bertrand Russell wrote, the problem, are you familiar with Pavlov's dogs? You've heard of it in any case. It does, the actual, what happened with Pavlov's dogs is not quite, not so important at the moment. Uh, the, but this is what Bertrand Russell comments about it. The problem which Pavlov successfully tackled is that of subjecting to scientific law what has hitherto been called voluntary behavior. The more this achievement is studied, the more important it is seen to be. And it's on this account that Pavlov must be placed among the most eminent men of our time. In other words, Bertrand Russell is saying, we have always thought that there was such a thing as free will and voluntary behavior was a reality. I voluntarily did this and not that. But Bertrand Russell says that's now outdated the reason I did this was because of some scientific law. The, thought, the fact that I thought it was free will is an illusion. I couldn't help but doing it. So he says, okay? So there's no free will. Everything we do and think is controlled by the previous distribution of particles in the universe, so we couldn't help but do it. Now compare this. Heavily armed children prowling Los Angeles, says a recent headline. The judge said about these children brought before him for shooting into crowds of people they did not know and setting fire to an old woman. They show no sense of empathy for their victims. It's almost like they are programmed robots out on the prowl to kill. Well, Bertrand Russell said they are programmed robots. In fact, we're all programmed robots. In fact, the judge, being a human being, is a programmed robot. And the politicians making a law saying you shan't set fire to old ladies are just doing it because they're programmed robots. Mm. And the police who arrest people for doing that are just programmed robots. Mm. We're all just programmed robots. And this lecture is just being given by a programmed robot. And your boredom with it is because you're programmed robots, or your enjoyment of it is because you're programmed robots. Right? Mm. But if there is free will, I'm not saying our actions are entirely by free will. Of course, there are physical factors affecting our reason and our will, obviously. The question is, are they the whole story or not? No, the free will does exist. That means that you and I, as human beings, can initiate action. We are not just doing what the previous distribution of particles in the universe is controlling us to do we can initiate, we can be a first cause. And that means that dynamics will never be complete. Okay? Mm. Mm. The existence of personal beings such as you and me must mean that the source of the mystery cannot be less than us, and therefore cannot be mere blind energy. So Star Wars believing in the force, an impersonal force governing the universe must be wrong, I'm saying, he, we dare no longer call this source, it must be personal. However imperfectly, we all know something of the meaning of love, and he who cannot be less than us must be very great and everlasting love. That seems reasonable to me. And love is self-giving. You follow the logic? I'm trying to reason, and perhaps I shouldn't give this reasoning. I'm saying that the the one, the one who lies behind the existence of the universe, behind matter, behind, behind mind, and behind morality and goodness and beauty, cannot be less than anything else in the universe. And we're in the universe, so he, must, he cannot be less than personal, therefore he must be personal. He cannot be less than love, because we know at least something of the meaning of love. Therefore he must be very great love. You can't love unless you're self-giving. So self-giving love must be at the heart of all things. Okay, the cross. Mm. Another mystery facing us all is the existence of the opposite of goodness of beauty, the sheer evil, injustice, death, sorrow, and ugliness of so much of life. How can the existence of goodness and evil be brought together? The gospel of Christ does make coherent sense of the mystery of the human experience. I don't claim it solves it, but it makes coherent sense of it. 
We cannot prove the gospel, but other attempts to understand reality are finally incoherent, I would say. Fundamental to the gospel is the belief that God has not remained distant from suffering and evil, but carried its terrible weight in the person of Jesus in whom all things hold together. Out of his death on the cross came the resurrection and glory which enfolds all things. Right. In this life we choose whether to accept or reject this eternal love. Our decision has eternal consequences. In the teaching and miracles of Jesus we are given a foretaste of the world's redemption. On the cross eternal self-giving love and wisdom are revealed. Do you think that's too good to be true? Sometimes I'm tempted to think so because it's t it too contains its own mystery and awe. But is there another way to understand the existence of the universe, the world, human life, beauty, goodness and evil? I don't think so. The Christian way has its own mystery but it is coherent. Although Christ's human life on earth occurred 2,000 years ago, about 2,000 miles from here, it nevertheless, nevertheless spans the whole of time and space as do electrons, by the way, in in the way he created it. Mm. The Bible is the story of its beginning, progress and fulfillment in Christ and then its final culmination at the end of the age. As we read the Bible, opening our hearts in prayer to God's love, we find a reality beyond this world so that our life in this world is given forgiveness, meaning and purpose. Okay, What's, am I gone on too long? Because uh, I, I did have a bit... 20 past, perhaps I'll just stop there. Pardon? Okay. I, am I okay, Alison? Okay. Are you cold? Mm. <laughs> okay. Now, Don Carson and his young son. Don Carson was a speaker at the Cree Fellowship of Ministers uh, not the January before last, and this is what he said. Where did you get those blue eyes, son? He said to his son. Neither you, neither your mother nor I have blue eyes. And his young son said, well, I got my blue eyes from God, right? If his son had been 15 years older and studying biology, he might have answered, Mendel's law of inheritance explains it, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which of the two answers is correct? Mm. Both. Both are correct. Which is the most foundational? Right? There wouldn't be any Mendel's laws of inheritance if it wasn't for the Creator. The first answer is the most foundational answer. They're both correct. And Don Carson went on to use a similar model in discussing questions relating to Christian theology. Now, what, one question he didn't ask, which I would like to ask following that module is th model, is this. Here is a question I liked to have discussed. Who was responsible for the cross and the death of Christ? One, the Jews, the chosen people. Two, God. Both right. Okay? Which is the most foundational? If you forget number two as the answer, you become anti-Semitic. In rejecting Christ, they unwittingly fulfill God's purpose to use them for the blessing of the world. They re the chosen people rejected Jesus, but if they hadn't rejected Jesus, we wouldn't be here now. Our salvation and knowledge of God depends upon their sin. Alright? And therefore, what is God's continuing purpose for Israel? That is the question that exercises the mind of Paul in Romans, in the Romans epistle, especially one to, chapters 1 to 4 and 9 to 11. And summarize on the next slide. Israel's rejection of Christ was a sinful self-righteousness, says Paul. But God had purposed it, not forced it, from the beginning. So then, what is the purpose of God for the Jewish people? 
the relationship between Jewish Israel and the church. Well, eternal salvation is through faith in Christ alone, Paul says, but that does not cancel God's promise for Israel in world history. See, at the end of Romans 2, Paul says, look, it's not physical circumcision that matters, it's spiritual circumcision that matters. What's the logical conclusion? The physical circumcision and the Jewish people have no more significance then. But Paul refuses to draw that conclusion. He says, by no means. Why does he refuse to draw that conclusion? Because it was their unfaithfulness which enabled God to reveal his faithfulness. It was their unfaithfulness in rejecting Christ which enabled God's faithfulness in love for the whole world, Jew and Gentile alike, to be revealed. That's his argument. Their history will testify to the reliability of God's word. And Romans 11, the church must not be self-righteous in its attitude to Israel. If it is self-righteous, it will be cut off, just as the Jews were cut off for their self-righteousness. That is the argument of Romans. And of course, there are a lot of other things in Romans too, but that's the main argument, and it's not just Romans 9 to 11. It's Romans 1 to 16, interspersed with others, other great passages, 5, 6, 7, and 8, and, and the ethical passages after chapter 11. But that underlies the whole thing. Now, I would say in Christian preaching, the big story, that is the big story of creation to final redemption is necessary. The big story is focused in Christ. The law, the Psalms and the prophets, creation to the end, bear witness to him. Now, that's important, creation to the end, because the law, the Psalms and the prophets are not just concerned with the time up to Jesus' appearing. The law, the Psalms and the prophets talk about are to, about the beginning to the end of the world. And it's that whole story from the beginning to the end of sto- the world which is focused in and finds its meaning in Christ. That's why the whole story is needed of the world. It's not that Jesus, because Jesus fulfills the Old Testament, the Old Testament no, is no longer relevant anymore. That's the, it's the, the opposite conclusion. Because the Old Testament talks about the end of the world. In the long term, Christian lives will not be sustained only by Jesus can help you today type messages. Right? I think that's very important. The little story of your life and the little story of my life find their meaning in the big story, as part of the big story of what's happening from creation to the end of time. And if preaching doesn't make that clear, then it it won't survive long. The big story is what people need. In spite of postmodernism, people are still looking for the big story. I mark a lot of essays of non-religious students. I'm yet to read one which says that uh, what is true for you may not be true for me. And I'm, I'm yet to read one that says that. A lot of them say, well, I don't know whether God exists, and I may never know, may never know but they don't say that these, uh, these things it may be true for you, but not true for me. I, I never read that. I think the postmodernism is, a, is just a, a gigantic fraud, actually. <laughs> now, in special intensity, the big story represents humanity before God right? Because the big story is God and all creation. That includes the animals and uh, the, the world, the universe. And it's concentrated in God's relationship with human beings, because we're the link between earth and heaven. And it's concentrated further in the story of Israel, who in special intensity represent all nations. And that finds its meaning in Jesus. Its meaning is in Christ, in whom all things hold together. Karl Barth, a quotation from him, that's in Dogmatic St. Cloud. Frederick the Great once asked his personal physician Zimmermann, Zimmermann, can you have 
name me a single proof of the existence of God. And Zimmerman replied, Your Majesty, the Jews. By that he meant that if one wanted to ask for a proof of God, for something visible and tangible that no one could contest, which is unfolded before the eyes of all men, then we should have to turn to the Jews. Quite simply, they are to this present day, hundreds of little nations in the Near East have disappeared in the huge sea of nations, and this one tiny nation has maintained itself. It remarkably still keeps to the fore and is still recognizable physically and spiritually. Do you know how big Israel is today? Strathclyde region, that's its size. Did you know that? Even with the territories that are occupied. And yet it's the center of world attention. Now whatever the rights and wrongs of the Arab-Israel conflict, I don't particularly want to talk about that now, although I could do, but uh, it is a remarkable fact that with so few killings compared with other killings that are going on in the world, and yes, in the whole Arab-Israel conflict, there's been very few, it seems a lot when you watch television, very few compared with, say, what's gone in Burma, what's going on in Sudan, and all that. It still represents, still in the world's eyes, is that the world cannot take its attention off a nation the size of Strathclyde region with no oil. Right? (laughs) whatever the rights and wrongs of the Arab-Israel conflict are, that is a remarkable fact. Mm. Canon Professor Alan Richardson. Now he was, he, this is no so, sort of philosophic, uh, prophetic crank. Alan Richardson was a professor of theology at the Church of England in Nottingham University when I was a student there doing a different, I was doing a science subject but he was a professor of theology, he then later became a canon in the Church of England. This is what he writes in his Christian Apologetics. In view of the remarkable history of the Jewish people, it ought not to seem strange to us that they should have some unique destiny to fulfill in the providence of God. The history of other nations provides not even a single remote parallel to the phenomenon of Jewish existence down the ages to this day. What other nation of antiquity has preserved its identity and character as the Jews have done Though exiled from their homeland and dispersed throughout the world, throughout centuries of persecution, the Jewish race has survived the catastrophes which have so often destroyed the national identity of other peoples. Religious or secularized, a Jew remains a Jew, a voluntary or involuntary, I want to speak about that, witness to the truth that is symbolized in the story of God's covenant with Abraham. This striking fact of the persistence of the Jewish race has long been recognized as an important evidence of the truth of the biblical interpretation of history. Writing more than 200 years ago, Bishop Butler stated the argument in the following manner, and I'll give you that in a minute. But just, one is not saying that Jewish history bears conscious witness to Christ. Of course it doesn't. It's a non, they're a non-Christian people. But we have in the New Testament an example of a Jewish leader who bore unconscious witness to the atonement. Caiaphas. He says, uh, he says, it, we must give, we must sacrifice the life of this, it's John 11, forgotten the exact words, we sacrifice the life of this man for the sake of the whole nation. And then John's comment is, he did not say this on his own, but being high priest for that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the sins of the Jewish people scattered throughout the world, and not only for them, for the whole of God's people throughout the world. He did not say it on his own, but being a high priest for that year, he prophesied the atonement. And of course the priest's job was, the high priest's job was to make the sacrifice. I'm almost finished, Jack. Alan Richard continued, quoting 18th century Bishop Butler. The Jews are dis- <laughs> <laughs> The Jews are dispersed throughout the most distant countries in which God's in which state of dispersion they've remained fifteen hundred years. Bishop Butler lived the same time as John Wesley, by the way. They remain a numerous people, united amongst themselves distinguished from the rest of the world and everywhere looked upon in a manner which one scarce knows how to express, but in the words of the prophetic account of it, given so many ages before it came to pass, thou shalt become a proverb and byword among all the nations. And this is the last slide. 
Alan Richard quote continued. Butler goes on to speak of the appearance of a standing miracle in the Jews remaining a distinct people in their dispersion and the confirmation which the event appears to give of the truth of revelation. When Disraeli was asked what he thought was the most convincing proof of the existence of God, he replied, the Jews. It would seem that the Jewish people cannot escape their appointed mission of calling the attention of the rest of the world to the truth that God exists and has a purpose in history which must be <laughs> carried out. They remain scattered throughout all the world as a question addressed to every nation concerning its responsibility for the Lord of history. The uniqueness of the Jewish people is not something which has been invented by theologians. It is a startling fact of world history. Ladies and gentlemen, that's me finishing. Uh -huh.